What's up guys, welcome to today's video where we are going to go through your members only Q&A. If you wanna be a part of the members only Q&A, you must sign up for my membership. If you're on a PC or a Mac, you can look down below the screen there, you'll see a little join button next to the subscribe button. You click that join button and you can sign up for my membership. It's $2 per month, it grants you access to be able to answer or ask questions for the members only Q&A. Uh, it also allows you access to the members only playlist, which includes many videos on cycles and injections and home brewing, things like that. Um, so if you're interested in that, $2 a month to sign up for that. Also, if you click the join button or the join link down in the description box below for those of you that are on phones, click that link and scroll down a little bit, you'll see a $25 option where you can select that and you will be granted access to email me at any time asking any questions regarding like sources and things like that, cycles, detailed questions that you have. I will answer those as quickly as possible as long as you are a member. Now, if you sign up for, if you sign up for the $25 thing, ask a question and then cancel it and go back to the $2 question, like I, I can answer, I can, I'm only, I can only answer your questions while you are shown as a subscribing member. Okay. I, I'm, I'm sorry, but some of you have been doing that where you'll, you'll ask one question and then cancel it and switch back to the $2 thing. I, I can't, I'm, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna follow that. Okay. So, um, yeah. As long as you are a paying member of the $25 membership, I will answer any questions you want through email, chaseirons at gmail.com. Okay, let's get on with these questions. We've got quite a few, it looks like, from you guys. So away we go. First question from Lee Faircloth. Can you go into more slash greater detail on homebrew in future videos? You have a lot of people's attention. Keep up the great work on the channel. Of course I can go into more detail on homebrewing. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, except I don't really know exactly what more detail you would actually need. I mean, I have two videos right now that are available to the public where I talk about the pricing of homebrewing. And the other one, I can't quite remember exactly what we talk about in it, but it's uh, more on homebrewing and how easy it is, I, I believe. Um, and then in the members only video, in, in the members only playlist, I literally show you how to homebrew. So I'm not exactly sure what else you want. Um, if, you're, if you're talking about like maybe recipes, if you want more recipes, you're gonna have to sign up for the $25 membership and I will, you ask me for whatever recipe you want and boom, I'll send it to you immediately. Recipes that I have personally used that work very well. So um, yeah, that is that. Next question from Mr. A, very good job, Chase. Does JP use insulin and what is his protocol? I don't know if you're able to speak on this or if we don't really speak about it, me and JP speak about it. So, um, so I've been with Jordan Peters for 10 weeks now. Uh, I signed up for a 12-week plan. I'm going to sign up for another 12-week plan or maybe even a year if we can uh, cut a deal on that. But yeah, um, we really haven't talked a whole lot about cycle stuff. The way that it goes is it, it, like it's, it's my responsibility to bring up my ideas to him and then he can kind of give a little bit of a, a recommendation or, or his opinion on it. But he's not straight up just giving me, like, do this cycle, this is what you need to do. Because it's all about what the individual is ready for. And I think that's one of the reasons why he allowed me to sign up with him because, you know, I told him my background and what I know and what I've done and, you know, that I understand how to go about doing this in the way that he wants. And so we discussed it a little bit on how I was gonna plan on going forward. He, he either approves or says like a, a hint at an alternative because I mean, it, it's very much like, I'm very open in the fact that I tell him like, this is my choice. I know this is my decision, my choice. I'm not, you know, if anything goes wrong, none of this is on you. Like I totally understand that. 
Um, so as far as like insulin use goes, no, we haven't talked about it um, at all. That being said, um, I have not shared with you guys the fact that I have been using a little bit of insulin. <laughs> um, and yes, I'm on a cut right now. Uh, and that probably brings up a whole list of other questions from you guys. Like, how do you use insulin and cut? Because I was under the impression that you use insulin and most guys blow up and get fat when you have to be smart about your use, which I am. So, um, no, I haven't talked specifically with Jordan about insulin use. Personally, I do use a very small amount of Lantus and a very, very small amount of Humalog uh, post-workout with an HGH shot. So, um, yes, I'm using very, very small, small amounts of insulin and it is uh, helping out greatly. Um, but again, you know, that, those are things that I'll bring up to Jordan and he'll either like approve of it or, you know, give a, another opinion. Like for example, I was coming up, when I was coming up on 16 weeks of my cycle, I told him, I was like, okay, I need to start tapering off because I'm coming up on 16 weeks. And he goes, well, he didn't realize that it had been 16 weeks because he wasn't really keeping track of that. I was. He goes, would you be against going on to 20 weeks? And I was like, well, my health is good. My blood pressure is great. Everything feels great. Yeah, I don't have a problem going for 20 weeks. He was like, because I figure we'd go, um, I figured we'd go another, because when I was at 16 weeks, he was like thinking we'd go another four weeks of cutting before we go on a cruise. So, um, yeah, so he was like, that was one time that he interjected on what I said and was like, how about you take it to 20 weeks and then we're going to do a six week cruise before we push. And so, which those things uh, were two things that he said that I was not, um, not used to hearing or thinking about doing, like doing a 20, 20 week cycle and a six week cruise. But... I'm, I signed up with him to learn new things and try new things, and that's what we're going to do. So anyways, no, um, we don't really talk about that kind of stuff a whole lot. He's, he's definitely more pro like training and nutrition and focusing primarily on that and letting the gear side of things be more so my decision and just me asking for advices from him on it. And using that as more of like a supplement, but the most important thing to him is the training and the nutrition aspect, which it, as it should be for most people. So that is that. Um, next question from Randomized Alias. Is there any difference between being natty versus on gear? Yes. <laughs> also, does Greg do sets a method of eating roughly plus or minus 300 calories of maintenance work to lean bulk or is lean bulky in a unicorn and there needs to be some degree of overeating to make decent size gains. The thing about Greg's idea on bulking and cutting is, is it's not, he's just saying don't get fat. He's just saying don't do like a real fat ass bulk. That's all that he's saying. Like... And I feel I, okay, so I feel like to some degree, you kind of have to do that a little bit to build a solid foundation. I mean, if we, if we look at, you know, bodybuilders in their past and how they got started and how they initially got their size, most of them went through a phase where they got really fluffy. And I mean, I've had my fair share of fluffy off seasons. You know, I'm 240 pounds lean now. Those guys are 260 lean, 270 lean, you know? So part of me feels that, yeah, there is there is a little bit of a necessity when you're younger. That doesn't mean that it's not doable to lean, to, to, to have lean gains from the beginning. Um, the thing is, most of us are just, you know, uh, not disciplined at the start of this thing and um, yeah just don't know what we're doing when we're first getting started and we it all ends up leading to the same place where 
you know, we're all 240, 250, and jacked. But anyways, um, I, I, I feel like for beginners, it probably helps to go through all of that to learn about nutrition and learn about all those things. But if you go from the start and hire a coach, I bet you that a good coach could get you to grow lean from the beginning, which I would say is a much healthier, um, a much healthier, uh, much more optimal plan than getting fat in the off season. Um, but that's all that Gre that's all that Greg is saying. He he's saying don't get fat in the off season. And I totally agree with that because once your body fat gets beyond a certain level, your insulin sensitivity drops, you know, you're, you're, you're just becoming more fat at that point. And that's not what this is about, you know? So, um, I agree with Greg in that we should be trying to stay relatively lean as we try to grow. I don't think that there should be any point where you can't see your abs if you're serious about all of this. Um, but again, you know, when most of us get started on all this, we're not that serious and we don't know what we're doing. So, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of different ways to look at this. Um, my views have changed on this quite a bit in that uh, I do feel that um, you have to get lean enough to grow lean. And like right now, I'm the leanest that I've ever been, which is kind of sad. Um, but Jordan taking me to this place of this level of leanness makes me realize how much fat I can actually kind of put on and still be lean at the end of a bulk. You know, because we've cut out a significant amount of fat from my body. So, um, yeah, it's going to be really interesting to see how I do grow when we start growing uh, in that phase of things. So, um, but yes, there, there definitely is a difference between dieting. Oh, oh, you said, oh, you said dieting natty versus being on gear, not just being natty. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, sorry about that. Dieting natty versus dieting on gear. Yeah. I mean, if you're natural, yes and no. I mean, yeah, you respond better to calories quicker when you're on gear. Like things just happen quicker, you know, whereas when you're natural, you have to be a lot more precise and calculated with how you're going about things. Otherwise, you will just get fat, you know, um, or going the other way, like if you're trying to diet as a natural, if you do it too too hard, too fast, you'll lose a shitload of muscle. Whereas when you're on gear, there's a lot more leeway there because your body has a whole lot more nitrogen retention going on from the steroids that keeps the muscle on your body. Um, so, yeah, there there is a difference dieting naturally and dieting on gear, um, and that's probably the biggest the biggest difference is that the leaner you get natural, the more muscle you start losing as you get down to those single digit body fat levels. So sorry about that. Um, next question from Santosh K. Hi bro. What's your opinion on test only cycle in high doses, like one gram per week? And is it possible to get contest shredded on this cycle? Thank you so much for the information. Yeah, sure. It's possible. It's possible getting lean or or getting fat has everything to do with diet it has nothing to do with your hormones it has nothing to do with insulin either you, you know because a lot of people think oh you take insulin you get fat guys i'm on insulin and i'm getting leaner it's just it's about your diet it's about nutrition getting in contest shape is more so about nutrition than about the drugs and the supplements that you're using so just Keep that in mind. Whether you're bulking or cutting, the drugs don't matter. It's all about the diet. That's why, that's why nutrition and training are so much more important than gear. And that's, I feel like that's what I keep trying to get across to you guys is that that's why you shouldn't get on gear until you know how to diet and you know how to train. 
Otherwise, you'll be like me the first five years and look natural while you're on gear. You know, if you saw that video, I mean, looking back at those photos, I was that was a joke. But that's why I'm trying to, like, tell you guys these things. I'm trying to tell you, learn from my mistakes. That's why I share this kind of stuff. Because I've screwed around for a long time and until I started to kind of started to figure shit out. So... But what is my thought on a test-only cycle and high doses like a gram per week? I mean, it just depends on if you're ready for that. Um, like, I, I, could do, I could do that because I can handle a gram of testosterone without the need of a, an AI or an aromatase inhibitor. Like, I, don't, I won't get the same side effects as somebody that's just starting out. Like, if, if say, it's your second cycle and <laughs> your first cycle you were stupid and did 500 tests... And then your second cycle, you got even dumber and decided that you were going to do a thousand milligrams test. You would be a bloated, sloppy mess, probably, because you most likely wouldn't go into it being lean. <sighs> of course, you also mentioned that we're talking about getting in contest shape on a thousand milligrams of test. But again, it all comes back to your diet. If you want to get lean, you have to be in a deficit. You have to be on some sort of caloric deficit meal plan. That's all that matters in getting lean. Don't worry about the drugs that you're using. The drugs hold on to the muscle and the diet gets rid of the fat. The training helps stimulate more muscle. That's about it. So keep it simple, bros. Next question from Zippy. Loving the content, learning, not, learning a lot. My question is related to randomized al aliases question. How much of a surplus should you have when lean bulking on a cycle versus when doing it natural? I've read it takes 2,500 calories to build a pound of muscle, and as a natural, you should be expecting one pound of muscle a month max. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, don't... You, you're... You're really trying to... Uh... You, you can't... Okay. You can't force yourself into these like stereotypical numbers of like, I need to gain a pound of muscle a month or, or whatever. That's not the way that you should go about doing it. What I would recommend, if you want to grow lean as a natural or as an enhanced athlete, you need to figure out your maintenance calories and that means eat the same calories every damn day. Weigh yourself every damn morning and you weigh the same every damn morning. That's maintenance. Not look up some calculator and be like, this calculator says this is my maintenance, so that's my maintenance and I'm going to eat that. But what happens if you start eating that and you start gaining weight consistently? That's not your maintenance then. That's, that's you eating too much food. So what you need to do is figure out what your maintenance calories are. And eat at that for a good two solid weeks where you don't gain shit. You don't gain any weight at all. And then it's like, okay, that's my maintenance calories. Then all you've got to do is just add a little bit of carbs. That's it. Just add a little bit of carbs to it. Maybe 100 calories for a day. Do that. See what happens. At, that's 25 grams of carbs. Add it to your intra workout. Add that in. Pay attention to your weight. Weigh yourself every day. Take pictures of yourself every weekend and see, visually look at what's going on. Did your weight go up? Good. That's, that's progress. That's all, that's all you need. And you only added 100 calories. You only added 25 grams of carbs a day for training days or whatever. Like it doesn't take much. Don't try to force yourself into, I need to eat this many calories to gain this much. Like, because it's just not going to happen. What if you're training a shit and you, you aren't stimulating that kind of growth at that kind of rate? That's where you have, everybody's got to do their own thing and make their own adjustments and their own progress and pay attention to it. Because if, 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 if you try to force yourself into that and you want to stay lean while you grow, what if that is way too many calories for you and you just start putting on fat? You're going to force yourself to just keep doing that? No, that'd be stupid. We don't do stupid things here, okay? Um, yeah, 
small changes. Like I said, add 25 carbs to your intro workout. Keep weighing in. Pay attention in the, to the mirror. See what happens. Everybody's like, oh, you're going to see nothing from that, bro. Good. <laughs> Good. That means your metabolism picked up a little bit. You shouldn't be feeling anything. That's the other thing that I don't understand is some of you guys on gear are like, I'm not feeling it, bro. I'm not feeling... You're on hormones. Like, you shouldn't be... It's not fucking cocaine. Like, you shouldn't be feeling anything. You should... If you're feeling stuff when you shoot your testosterone, you're like, bro, I feel great. That's stupid. You're using too much. Like, you should feel normal, natural, even on gear. That's when you know you're at a good dose that your body can handle. If you're not feeling rage and side effects and, oh, I'm so horny on this. Like, that, no. That means you're just, you're abusing shit. Like, you should feel normal. You shouldn't feel like shit on your hormones. You shouldn't feel, you know, you shouldn't feel out of your own normal, you know, psyche. I don't know. I went off on a tangent there. Sorry. But um, small changes, guys. This whole thing is about baby steps. Quit trying to force yourself into these ideas that I can gain a pound of muscle a month. The other thing there is like, what if you're already at your genetic potential as a natural? No, it won't work. You will not gain another pound of muscle a month. It depends on where you're at in your training. It depends on where you're at. Like if you're 5'10", 165 pounds and 6% body fat, every pound that you gain beyond that is going to be fat. I guarantee it. That's what's genetically potential. You gain any muscle beyond you. You you gain any weight beyond that parameter. It's fat. It's plain fat. You're not going to make any more gains beyond that, unless you have better genetics than the average Joe. So you have to consider that. You can't just force yourself to gain a pound of muscle a month as a natural if you're already near your genetic limit. So, yeah. I mean, if you're if you're 5 foot 10 and 120 pounds, yeah, sure. You could probably gain a pound of muscle a month, but if you're at the end game of your natural ability, no. It's just it's stupid to try to force yourself into that idea. Next question from HS Lee, any experience with injectable L-carnitine? No. No experience with it. So I can't, I'm sorry, I can't answer any bit of your other questions. Because I've never used it. I've looked into it a little bit and some people try to use it for fat loss. I just don't see the point, you know? I mean, just diet. Use your diet for fat loss. If you need a boost in in anything, don't use L-carnitine, just use ephedrine use clen like i don't know there, there's no there's no reason to try to recreate the wheel here i mean plenty of people have gotten shredded without l-carnitine and you can too so but no I, i've never used it i've looked into it a little bit and it just seemed like it wasn't worth my time and i don't think it's worth your time either so i'm sorry i, I don't have an answer for you there the reason people kind of look into these things is because they want to speed up progress. They want to do things faster than what's, than what's optimal. Just give yourself time. Take your time. Take your time to lose the weight. You know, don't, don't get in a rush. I can't express that enough. Whether you're trying to grow or cut, don't get in a hurry because it's just, it's just not going to work out the way that you want it to. You, you could do so much better if you just take your time. Give yourself the time to make progress properly. Next question from Zippy again. Another question. I've read when natty and intermediate, when bulking, you should expect to put on muscle and fat in a one-to-one -one ratio. I've heard this referred to as a P ratio. How does ratio change when bulking on a cycle? Again, it depends on where you're at and your genetic potential, man. I mean, 
if again, like I said, five foot ten, one sixty five, six percent body fat. No, I would say it's a one. You, it's a one. You gain one pound of fat, you gain no pounds of muscle. <laughs> it just goes up from there. Um, no, I, I don't. That's. I don't think that that's uh, that's in it. Again, that's nothing that you should be concerned about. That's nothing that you should be worried about. I mean, the thing is, is if that is true and you gain one pound of muscle and one pound of fat as you grow, guess what? When you start dieting, you're going to lose one pound of muscle, one pound of fat until you get back to 165 pounds of fat at five or 165 pounds of lean muscle at five foot 10 and 6% body fat. You're going to gain it at a one to one ratio. You're going to lose it at a one to one ratio until you're back to your genetic potential for being lean. So, and if you think that you're there, if you think that you're 200 pounds and 6% body fat as a natural, you're not, you're still like 15%. So I'm sorry. Um, but yeah, zippy, you're, you're trying to, you're really trying to, uh, stick within these parameters of what's possible naturally. And, uh, when you're, when again, like when you're at the end of your genetic potential, like there's, you, we need more context to this. Somebody that's 130 pounds, they'll probably gain more muscle than fat. You know, um, somebody that's on gear. Yeah. They can put on, they can definitely put on more muscle than fat because their nitrogen retention is much higher from the hormones. So, um, all right. Next question from Sunny Vegas. Thoughts about Omnitrope? I hear it's similar to Humatrope. Uh, Omnitrope is good. It's one of the U.S. approved pharmaceutical grade HGH. Yeah, I'd say it's on the same scale. It's on in the same the same level of legitness as Cyzan, Nortotropin, Genotrope. Um, yeah, somatrope. It's all, yeah, omnitrope is good. Next question from Nick Garwood. You said that an average enhanced lifter will gain about seven pounds of lean muscle per year. Over the last year, you've gained 30 pounds of lean muscle. How do you account for your significantly better results? Great question, Nick. And I know we talked about this behind the scenes a little bit, but it is a great question. If you look at my videos a year ago, I cut down to 213. Right now I'm 240 pounds. It's been a year. How has this happened? All right, guys, when you compare a physique from one year to the next, it has to be under the same circumstances. That's why you can only like, that's why with bodybuilders, you can only compare their stage weights because it, nothing else matters beyond that point. You know, it has to be under the same conditions. Like, if you check out how much weight a bodybuilder gains in stage weight each year, it's usually about five, between five and 10 pounds every year that they'll gain in stage weight. Even though it's like they'll have, they'll be on stage, let's say they weigh 250, and then in the off season they weigh 290, but they're still kind of lean. Can you say, oh, I put on 40 pounds of muscle? No, you can't. Like that's not, that's the, that's the difference there. Like for me, a year ago, I was in a weight loss competition. I was running my ass off. I was eating very little. I was extremely lower carb. Um, glycogen stores were nothing. Uh, I was dehydrated. I was trying to just weigh as little as possible. I could totally do that again. Except I imagine if I did that right now, I would probably get down to about 220 and be dehydrated and glycogen depleted and just shitty looking and feeling. Um, and then it'd be like, yeah, that's seven pounds gained in a year. But what you need to do is go back two years and look at where I was two years ago. Two years ago, I was 241 pounds about this time of the year. I wasn't this lean as I am now, but I still had abs. I looked pretty good. I was 241. 
Um, but yeah, now I'm 240-ish and much leaner. So if you go two years, compare those, which are probably similar circumstances, tell me how much I've gained in two years compared to one year. So um, yeah, think about that. So you, you just, you have to consider the circumstances, you know, that you're comparing. Just like with, uh, God, I can't remember his, his actual name. Um, on Instagram, his name's PH Deadlift. Um, I can't, I can't remember his name. But he was a power lifter turned bodybuilder. And as a power lifter, he spent so long trying to break a, a record at like 190 pounds and was just basically like starving himself, dehydrating himself to be that weight because that's the weight that he competed at. And then I believe he gave up on that idea and went straight bodybuilding. And now he's still incredibly lean and 80 pounds heavier in a year, I think. And people are like, wow, we put on 80 pounds of muscle in a year. No, you have to compare the circumstances. You know, he's full of fucking glycogen now, full of water, still very lean. It's just everything. You have to look at it like the difference between a ribeye steak and a piece of beef jerky. That's the difference. You know, when we, when someone's on stage contest ready, they don't want to be beef jerky. <laughs> they want to be a steak up there that's very lean. But um, imagine that when he was trying to be 190 pounds he was beef jerky like he was dehydrated glycogen gone and all that and now he's a full full of glycogen full of water steak all of his muscles are filled out and yeah he's holding 80 more pounds that's not that doesn't mean that it's 80 pounds of muscle so it's a good question um but yeah you have to compare circumstances that's why when you know, since I've been doing this, I always compared, I would only compare where I ended with one bulk, you know, compare, compare the end of my bulking seasons and only compare the end of my cutting seasons. Because you can't compare a cutting season to a bulking season and be like, oh, I put on 50 pounds of muscle. It just, no, because this, you're under completely different circumstances. So if I compared like all of my bulking seasons, each year I gained my, my max weight that I got to went up about five or 10 pounds a year. And then as my cutting seasons progressed, I would cut down like last, last year I did a very shitty job cutting because I was trying to do a weight loss competition. But I got down to 213 and I was absolutely wrecked. But over the years, it was like, it used to be 190 that I would cut down to, 195, 200, 205, and it just would slowly, I'd end up getting to the same place, being as lean as I was the year before. Those are the ways that you can tell how somebody's doing. That, those were like my stage weights for me. Next question. Changes from injecting twice a week to daily. Side effects and results. How to avoid acne during cycle. Um, the changes between injecting only twice a week and to injecting daily is that daily injections give you a flat line of hormones. Two times a week injections give you a spike in hormones and then a dip, and then another spike when you inject and a dip. I prefer as stable as possible. The more stable your hormones are, the less likely you're going to experience side effects. Plain and simple. And that's why I do everyday injections all the time. For the long, I can't remember the last time I, I didn't do everyday injections. And I feel that that's one way to get around acne on cycle is injecting daily so that your hormone levels are super stable and it's kind of hard for your body to get acne from unstable hormones. The other thing that I have found to really help clear up my skin is it is more clear than normal is using glutathione, injectable glutathione, 200 milligrams a week. Now, if you have pretty bad acne, I would start off 200 milligrams per day for a week. And then I would back off and do 200 milligrams per week, one shot, uh, one, not, don't, don't inject it every day, you know, after the first week. 
Um, but just one shot, 200 milligrams per week um, beyond that. Glutathione is a great antioxidant. It's the king, queen, whatever you want to call it, of antioxidants. Um, you can get injectable glutathione from Amino Asylum. It's one of my new affiliates. Amino Asylum. Go to them, aminoasylum.com. Use my code CHASE15 for 15% off. You go to their website, you'll see that they have a lot of different injectable aminos, a lot of different oral SARMs. They've even got a couple uh, different injectable other things. So go check them out. Use my code CHASE15 for 15% off. Uh, I highly recommend getting glutathione. I do not recommend getting the Corona care injections. They can be, it's a little harsh in PIP. Um, yeah, I do not recommend getting that. The, the Corona care vial has vitamin C in it, glutathione in it, and vitamin B12, I believe, I think. Don't get that one. I think the vitamin C is pretty harsh in it and it, it'll lump uh if you do it <laughs> like that you if you're going to inject aminos inject it into the muscle i recommend sticking to your glutes because uh if you if you put something like that in your delt and it doesn't absorb very well it'll leave, leave a little knot and everybody will see it don't do it subcutaneous it'll leave a little bump um, I didn't. I've heard from other people that it did. So always, always, always inject your aminos intramuscular. So don't buy the Coronacare. Buy the glutathione. Follow that protocol I just laid out. That should greatly help your acne for real. So give that a shot. Buy one vial of that. Use my code. 15% off. All right, next question, Alvaro RG asks, test sit versus test enanthate. Um, they have different half-lives. That's it. <laughs> I, I don't, I mean, some people will get, some people will claim to have more pip from enanthate than cipionate or vice versa. I think that has more to do just with the brewing process and whatever the, the cook that made it, whatever he put into it. You know, if they're made under the exact same circumstances with the exact same uh, recipe, I think they're fairly identical. But yeah, the only real difference is the half-life. And to be honest, I don't even care about half-life because I inject every day. And when you inject every day, you don't have to worry about that. So. Inject daily and don't care. It's not important. I believe Enanthate's half-life is longer. I, I mean, I don't care, though. Next, Ben Munoz. Post-cycle protocol for keeping maximum gains. For keeping maximum gains, my recommendation is to don't do a post-cycle protocol. Just go on a cruise. And that's it. <laughs> like, that's... Otherwise, uh, if you do a PCT... You're going to start losing, but I mean, to maximize your gain, yeah, to keep maximizing gains, if you're going to come off cycle and try to go natty again, train hard, increase calories, and your genetic potential will, will do the rest because there's really not a whole lot that you can do about that. But um, as far as like a PCT protocol, you know, if you were using, say, testing anthate or cipionate, as your testosterone base. Um, you need to wait five weeks for that to clear. So you'll once you stop injecting that, don't inject anything at all, anything at all, for five weeks. Because your testosterone will slowly be dropping by half every week, basically. And it takes about five weeks to clear. So say if you were on 500 milligrams of test, at the end of week one, you'd be at 250 at the end of week two you'd be at 125 at the end of week three you'd be at 70 or, or 63 and each week it just cuts down in half until it's basically gone and then at that point that's when you want to get on hcg hcg and aromasin hcg at 
2,000 IUs every other day, and I believe aromacin at 12.5 milligrams every other day. And doing that for three weeks, you need to get a blood test to see where your testosterone levels are at. And if your testosterone is in a normal range, then you start Novodex for like a 15 to 20 day protocol. And that's pretty much it. Next question, Tomas Nanasi. Main reason using metformin and what will be your protocol once you start it? I talked about this uh, the other day. I'm not gonna be using metformin. Um, I'm gonna be using berberine instead because berberine has less uh, gastrointestinal side effects. If I was going to use metformin, I would use 500 milligrams every single day um, with my last meal before going to bed. The reason for using it is that it increases uh, insulin sensitivity uh, greatly, lowers blood sugars greatly. Having lower blood sugars leads to lower inflammation, but that's the main reason. It's just to keep blood sugar in a healthy range, keeping insulin sensitivity very high. That's the main reason to use metformin. That's the main reason to use berberine. The problem with metformin is that it causes some gastrointestinal issues. Um, there has been a recall on some metformin for uh, causing cancer. So um, metformin's a drug. Berberine is not a drug. So I'm gonna go the berberine route because berberine has worked better in some cases than metformin for people. So, um, yeah, berberine, it is. All right, next question from Chase Gillum. Different slash importance in the ratios of these kidney values on blood work. Bun, bun creatinine, GFR. Also thoughts on pellets for TRT and add-ons, things you take year-round on TRT. How many questions are you going to ask, Chase? Come on, man. Um... The kidney markers, I think, are stupid. The only thing that you need for your kidneys, uh, for any of us, is a cystatin C test with EGFR. That's going to be the most accurate kidney test that you can get. Because if you have an, uh, an enhanced level of muscle, if you have a significant amount of muscle, your creatinine levels are going to be high, no matter what you do, most likely. And that's going to skew the test, and that's going to make you freak out and think your kidneys are failing. But if you get a cystatin C test, you'll see that your, your EGFR is fine. The difference between my EGFR with the cystatin C test was that on cystat, the cystatin C test gave me a GFR of 120, which means excellent kidney health. Uh, the creatinine kidney test gave me uh, a GFR of like 70, which is fine, but I mean, 120 is better, you know? So... Cystatin C test is, is what you want. Thoughts on pellets for TRT? No, don't do it. Stupid. I'm just kidding. I don't, I don't know. I haven't looked into it. I inject. I inject my testosterone. And I think you should as well if you're going to do it. Things you could take year-round on TRT. Any feel-good sups that would not affect blood work in a negative way. I mean, the, the health supplements that I use. Curcumin. Berberine. ALA, chromium picolinate, uh, citrus bergamot, grapeseed extract, celery seed extract. The health supplements that I use, I mean, those are great to take for your health if you're on TRT or cycle. Next question. Damien Anderson, what's your thoughts on CBD and THC in relation to recovery and training? CBD is a farce. I think it's crap. I think it does nothing. I think it's a placebo effect because most people experience no benefit. THC, the benefit is that it increases appetite. So if you have trouble eating, use some THC. Um, it does also help you go to sleep. However, I have read recent research that said that the sleep that you get on THC is not good for building muscle. I saw it. I read it. I don't remember where I read it, but I retained that information and I have THC in my cupboard back here. I was using it and I stopped since reading that because um, I've seen many coaches agree THC just does not belong in bodybuilding. If you're going to use THC, use it in the middle of the day to help stimulate appetite, but do not use it for sleep. Whew, man, we're getting through these. Next question, Jim McKnight, looking good, Chase. While you were cutting, I take it no insulin, right? Nope, I am on insulin. So 
Cool. Uh, what's your feeling on clan and T3 or T4? I don't think that they're necessary. Uh, T3 or T4, I don't think they're necessary at all. Clan, I think, should be saved for when you're as lean as I am right now, even though I haven't used any. If you get to the point where you're where I'm at and you're trying to get on stage, I think now would be the time for me to use it, but I'm not going on stage anytime soon. So I'm not on Clen, but that would be the time to use it. I think it's a great drug for that. Bulking phase T4, T3, anabolic nutrient partitioning effect. I don't it's not worth it. It's not worth messing with your thyroid. I used to, but your body handles it just fine. Even if you're on HGH your body handles T4 just fine. So the, some research shows that it depletes you of T4, but your body catches back up and you don't, you just, it's not essential while on GH, it's not essential while on cycle, it's not essential for anything, especially if you have a normally functioning, functioning thyroid. So no need for it, I haven't used it at all. Matthew Sparks, I wanna know your thoughts on Sustanon. It's the, currently the testosterone that I use. I've been using Sustanon as my main source of testosterone for a very long time. I love it. I think it's great. I, re I reacted well to the past on test and DECA cycles. Okay. Tren and I don't work well together at all. You look fucking great right now. This is not my real picture. Thank you, Matthew. The only question I saw in there was my thoughts on Sustanon. I think it's great because it has... It, it helps promote very stable hormone levels, and I'm all about that. Even though I inject every day, like I could use Pro and still be exactly the same level of uh, stability in my hormones. Um, but I've just always used Sustanon because, I don't know, it just works well with me. I, I feel like, uh, you know, when I start taking it, the, the rise that I get... Um, in my levels is slow and smooth, which I like. I wouldn't want to go on prop and just shoot right up right away because I like smooth changes in my hormones. So that's, that's my reasoning for that. Next question, Steve Rich. If you had to wash your feet using your hands or a washcloth, oh, would you use your hands or a washcloth? I wouldn't use either. I don't wash my feet. I would take the, a squirt bottle of soap and just squirt it down on my feet and then just kick my feet around and then rinse them. That's it. All right. Oh, we're almost done. Christoph Lintermans asks, doing a mild dose of 500 test and 500 NPP per week. Test for 12 weeks, NPP for 10. Any experience with NPP? Yes, I've talked about it a lot. I use it. And I've talked about it in all my cycles, I think. I'm not using it right now in this cycle um, because I'm out. I don't have any. But yes, I have lots of experience with it. I've been taking Tren in the past, but mental side hit me too hard. It's hard to find a replacement. Any other compound you'd recommend to either replace NPP or add to my current plan? Um, so... If you watch any of my cycle videos, you guys would know that I love using testosterone, NPP, Primobolin, Masteron, Tren. I like all those things. You mentioned NPP and Tren, and a replacement for NPP or Tren, I would say Primobolin, hands down. Replace NPP with Primo, replace Tren with Masteron. That's it. Romeo Salinas, best way to get back to working out after being injured and unable to walk basically for 10 months. Get a physical therapist is my suggestion. You probably should get an occupational therapist and a physical therapist for that. I am not either one of those, so I can't really speak on that. Um, and then the last question from the same, same man, Romeo Salinas. Best foods and supplements, any supplements, to reduce inflammation and increase recovery from the back surgery. Um, best foods, n normal, natural foods. If you can't, if you can't kill it outside or pick it from a tree or the ground outside, don't eat it. Any supplements to reduce inflammation? Curcumin, fish oil. Uh, those are the best inflammation products there are. I would also get on glutathione because it is great at uh, reducing inflammation. But that's it. That's all the questions, guys. Um, that was a lot. So 
Thank you so much for your questions. Thank you for your time. I doubt very many of you got to the very end of this, but if you do, I appreciate you. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you for your support. Remember, nobody cares. Train harder. And I will see you all next time.